you know that where Christ is absent, spiritual darkness reigns. That only makes biblical sense because Jesus is, in fact, the light of the world. And so without Christ, there's going to be darkness. One of the things that you see in the New Testament is that Jesus confronted a form of darkened Judaism. Even people who possessed the truth had, had darkened it with their idolatry, such that the Pharisees were pursuing a salvation by means of law-keeping. The Sadducees had largely given up on the spiritual components of the Scripture and had pursued a course of political power and compromise with the Romans. And so without Christ, there was darkness. There was darkness within Judaism. There was also darkness within the pagan world. You know that there was a pantheon of gods that the Romans worshipped. There was temple prostitution, sorcery, and, and magicians abounded. Without Christ, there was, there was darkness. And so, every time the gospel took a step forward, every time the church advanced into new territory, it walked into spiritually dark territory. It proceeded into spiritual darkness. So today I want to ask a very simple question. How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? How did that happen? How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? And as we look to the scriptures to find the answer, I invite you to open with me to the last verse of Acts chapter 12. In the black Bible in the pew in front of you, Acts 12 is on page 921. Open that Bible, open your Bible, open your Bible app, put your eyes on the Word of God. And as you're doing that, I want to remind you that in Acts chapter 11, the church at Antioch was thriving. Saul and Barnabas had been teaching there for a year, but then a prophet by the name of Agabus stood up and prophesied a famine upon the land. And so the, the church took up an offering and sent Paul and Barnabas with the offering to Jerusalem. And then Luke Luke turned his attention in Acts chapter 12 to the usurper king, to Herod Agrippa, who had murdered James and arrested and tried to murder Peter also, but ultimately was judged by the Lord for his blasphemy and idolatry. And now as we return to Acts chapter 12, we're going to pick up as Barnabas and Saul return from Jerusalem, where they have given the gift to the saints in Jerusalem, and now they're on their way back to the church in Antioch. And what we're going to read about is this, the first intentional church-sponsored missions trip ever. The first intentional church-sponsored missions trip ever. And as we read about that, I want you to have this question in your mind. How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? And then listen for how the Holy Spirit did it all. And it's with that in mind that I'll read from Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 25. And as we read together, let's remember that this is God's holy word. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to, to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, 
and you will be blind un and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. If we ask the question, how did the gospel triumph in, in spiritually dark territory, the answer to that question is incredibly important because if we can answer that question biblically, then we can know how the gospel will triumph in the spiritually dark territory that stands outside of the front door of your home and mine. How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? Well, Luke says, firstly, that the Holy Spirit called the messengers. The Holy Spirit is the one who called and commissioned the messengers who were going to go out into that spiritually dark territory. So, verse 25, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service. And if you, if you compare that to Acts chapter 11, the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So we're picking up as Barnabas and Saul return, and John Mark was with them. Now, according to Colossians chapter 4, John Mark is a cousin of Barnabas, so it makes sense for him to, to come with them as they prepare to go on this mission, and they return to the church at Antioch. And when they're at Antioch, uh, Luke says that there are certain leaders in the church, prophets and teachers, and it gives you an idea of something of the composition of the early church and maybe why they were so passionate about engaging in the first intentional church-sponsored missions trip. And so he lists these leaders. There was Barnabas, and he was, you remember, a native of Cyprus, and then there was Simeon who was called Niger, and his first name is Jewish, but his last name, Niger, is Latin, and it means black. And evidently, in all likelihood, Simeon, whose name was Niger, was a black African. Lucius was from Cyrene, which is in modern-day Libya along the northern coast of Africa. And then there was Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch is Herod Antipas, the one whom Jesus called that fox, the one who insulted Jesus when Jesus was arrested and about to be persecuted. Well, that Herod Antipas had been raised in a regal fashion because he was a son of Herod the Great. And oftentimes, great men had foster sons that they raised along with their sons so that their son had a peer that he would learn with. Their son had a peer that he would he would study with, their son had a peer that he would engage in combat with, and those, those peers were known as foster brothers, and that's the word that is used here. Menaean was a foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, and then there was also Saul. And Luke says that while they, that is the church at Antioch, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and it's important that fasting almost always goes along with seeking the will of the Lord for a particular thing or praying about a particular thing. The reason prayer and fasting go together is this, that when your stomach grumbles because you're fasting, it reminds you, oh, I'm supposed to be praying for this particular thing because I don't know about you, but my prayers go, and I don't have a lot of focus when I pray, and sometimes my mind drifts, and then my stomach rumbles, and it reminds me, oh, that's right, I'm supposed to be praying. And so they're intentionally praying. They're, they're fasting. And this indicates that this mission was intentional because the text strongly implies what they're praying and fasting about is this, who should we send? Now, they've made a determination that they're going to go on a missions trip, and now they're asking the Holy Spirit who they ought to be sending now, previously, there were independent evangelists, right? Stephen was an independent evangelist. Philip was an independent evangelist. Barnabas did some evangelism. Peter was out doing some evangelism. There were people who had been scattered from the persecution that enveloped the church in Jerusalem, and they had gone out, and they had shared their faith as they went out. But here, what we have is an intentional church body that decides it's going to go out and send people to places where the gospel has not gone so that they can tell others about Jesus for their salvation. This is what they're seeking to do right here. And the Holy Spirit then chooses messengers that the church must send. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. And then they engage in more 
prayer and fasting and lay their hands upon them. In other words, it's an example of, of what it means to rely on the Lord alone. We're reliant upon the Lord and we lay hands on them. It's an outward recognition of the inward call of the Holy Spirit. And in all likelihood, the Holy Spirit said this through one of the prophets assembled. I've chosen Barnabas and Saul to go on this mission. And so they consecrate them to the task at hand, which is a short-term missions trip. And verse 4 is very explicit. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit they went down to Seleucia. So the church commissioned them. The church sent them out. But it's also very clear that the cause, the empowerment behind it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit called them. The Holy Spirit commissioned them. The Holy Spirit sent them. The Holy Spirit works through the church that Jesus formed. And that makes sense because it's Jesus' church and Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would power the ministries of the church. And so the Holy Spirit is empowering the ministry of the church. And they go down to Seleucia, which is a, a seaport. And from there they sail to Cyprus, to the eastern side of the island, to a place called Salamis. Again, Barnabas is a native of Cyprus. Probably John Mark knows the island well also. And as became their common practice, they preached firstly in multiple synagogues, in the plural synagogues of the Jews, and John Mark was there to assist them. And that word can mean he either assisted them in the teaching ministry or he assisted them by, by being a physical helper to them, by, by taking care of their clothes, by packing their luggage, maybe by cooking for them. And the latter is probably what's in mind that John John Mark was there to provide physical service to Bar Paul and Barnabas, and Paul and Barnabas were the ones who were called to engage in the Great Commission ministry that the Lord had called them to. And so this gospel mission steps out from the church at Antioch into spiritually dark territory, purposefully, intentionally, prayerfully steps out into spiritually dark territory. How did the gospel triumph in this spiritually dark territory? Well, the Holy Spirit called the messengers. I went on a mission trip once with a guy not from this congregation. I'll just say to you this, not from this congregation. Are you hearing me? Don't try to think in your mind. You don't know this congregation and you don't know this guy. Don't try to think in your mind who was this, okay? We'll call him Joe Dokes. Joe Dokes was not from this church. We went on a mission trip together. Joe Dokes did not listen to the instructions the missionary gave. Joe Dokes did not uh, really participate. Uh, if, you're, if you're former military, this, this term will make sense to you. Joe Dokes was on his own plan, right? He was on his own plan the whole time. It was pretty clear that he was there for a cheap vacation to an exotic place. That's why he was there. And he spent most of the time off by himself taking pictures. He didn't really participate in the mission to which we had been called the Holy Spirit wasn't upon him. Let's put it that way. Well, today still, the Holy Spirit calls people to do work in the church. He calls people to missions. That doesn't take place today by a direct revelation. It's not as though the Holy Spirit says, you know, to Brian, Brian, I want you to send so-and-so on a mission. And then Brian comes as a prophet to the church and says, the Holy Spirit told me so-and-so is supposed to go on a mission. Okay, so we're not divinely inspired in the same way that the prophets were, but what we have is, one, the inward conviction of the Holy Spirit. So calling begins with an inward conviction of the Holy Spirit. You engage in prayer, in sober judgment of your gifts, your abilities, and your experience, and also of your motives for desiring to go. And ultimately and prayerfully, you arrive at the inner conviction that God is calling me to go to Kuala Lumpur. It's where I'm supposed to be to minister Christ in this particular capacity. But then calling also has not just your inward experience, but secondly, the, the confirmation of the church. As the church then prayerfully looks at you and evaluates with sober judgment your gifts and abilities and your experience and says, yeah, we agree. We see that in you. We see that what God has done in you and for you and how He's equipped you is exactly what's needed in that place at this time. And we concur that this inward calling you've received is also the outward calling of the church. Or it says, you shouldn't set foot in Kuala Lumpur. What are you, what are you thinking? 
And so calling is comprised of both the inward call of the person and the outward call of the church, and both are overseen by the same Holy Spirit for this reason, because when the Holy Spirit calls, He also equips. Do you believe that? When the Holy Spirit calls, He also equips. No calling, no equipping. No calling, you go to Kuala Lumpur and you spend your days with a camera off by yourself taking pretty pictures of birds because you're not called and then you're not fired and inspired from the inside out. You're not driven to fulfill that mission. And so what then is your role? In the absence of divine revelation, the Holy Spirit's no longer just, you go. Here's what you do. Pray and engage in sober judgment of yourself and ask this question of the Holy Spirit, what is my mission field? Do you believe you have one? Every Christian is a missionary. We're just missionaries. Some of us are obedient and some of us are more disobedient, but we're all missionaries. You're a missionary. I'm a missionary. We're all missionaries. You are a missionary. Have you ever done this, prayed, Holy Spirit, what is my mission field? It's a dangerous thing because he might say to you, Kuala Lumpur, and you say, I don't want to go to Kuala Lumpur. I like it here. But have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed, Holy Spirit, show me, reveal to me my mission field? Take a minute. It's not a long prayer. Pray it right now. What is my mission field? Ask earnestly seek an answer, ask for clarity in the answer, and ask for the courage to obey when it comes. That's one thing you can do. See, there's power in ministry because where he calls, he also equips. And so if he does say, ultimately, I want you to go next door, there's power. If he does say, ultimately, I want you to go around the world, there's power. If he does say, I want you to be a missionary in your workplace, there's power. Because where he calls, he also equips. And then engage in prayer and sober judgment with each other. And be that sounding board for somebody else. Be that person who not only says, I have the inward conviction that I'm supposed to do this, but I'm going to go to the church and ask them, does, does this make sense to you as well? Because where the Holy Spirit calls, he also equips. And this is how the gospel triumphs in spiritually dark places. It triumphs when and because the Holy Spirit calls and commissions the messengers. So how did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? Well, the Holy Spirit called the messengers. That's what what we're told firstly. But secondly, the Holy Spirit also overcame the adversary. There's always an adversary to the work of God, and the Holy Spirit didn't simply call the messengers and equip them, but he overcame the adversary. Look at verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. So they moved from uh, uh, from east to west across the island. Luke doesn't report the outcome of their preaching in the synagogues. He simply says they came to Paphos. It was the seat of the Roman administration. And they had an encounter with a guy named Bar-Jesus. Okay, so he's Jewish. And his, the, you know, the name Jesus is a form of the name Joshua, and it means the Lord saves. Bar means son, so his name means son of Joshua or son of the Lord saves. But verse 6 says that he's a false prophet and a magician. So contrary to Saul and Barnabas, who are listed among the true prophets and teachers of the church, here's a Jewish false prophet who's also a magician named Bar-Jesus. It's important that Luke says he's a false prophet because, because of this. He's Jewish, and so he has familiarity with the Old Testament. He has to. And Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 12 says this. This is Moses talking to the people before they enter the promised land. He says, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving out these nations before you. And he also says in the following verses that a prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name 
that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Now, in, in telling you this about the character of this guy, I want you to understand this. This is why Luke says this. Because He's presenting to you a picture of a man who is not confused. He is not presented by Luke as an object for your sympathy. This is a willingly wicked man. This is a knowing charlatan. This is a man who is a willing instrument of the devil. This man ran in the circles of the proconsul who was not deceived because verse 7 says that he was a man of intelligence, better a man of, of thoughtfulness, a man who considered things and he desired to hear the word of God. But verse 8 says that the magician opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He resisted them. He argued and was antagonistic toward Paul and Barnabas, and he sought to turn the proconsul away. The, the word that says he sought to turn, it's translated in verse 10. It's the same word as making crooked, and it means to pervert. He sought to pervert the proconsul. He sought to create moral corruption where Barnabas and Saul were seeking to impart to him words of life. Do you see the contrast that's being painted between these people? In other words, he made a positive effort to hinder the word of God and morally to pervert the proconsul to whom Paul and Barnabas were speaking. He made a positive effort to hinder the Word of God. This is not just somebody who hears the Word of God and says, oh, that's not for me. This is a person who is actively committed to somebody else not hearing you tell them about Jesus. That's a whole different level of opposition. And I want you to note that he tried to push the proconsul, verse 8, away from the faith, away from hearing or believing the gospel. And so Luke presents Bar-Jesus as willingly wicked and directly doing the work of our adversary, the devil. This is who this man is. And therefore, in verse 9, Paul, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, in other words, the words that he's about to speak are not Paul's opinion, but God's opinion, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, calls him son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, a man who is making crooked or perverting the straight paths of the Lord. In other words, you're not the son of Joshua. You're not the son of the Lord saves. You're the son of the devil. You are the son of our adversary. Again, that's not Paul's opinion, it's the Holy Spirit's opinion, and he calls him an enemy of righteousness, a man who is filled with deceit and villainy, knowing, willing wickedness. This, for this man, you, other human beings, are simply prey, and he's perverting straight paths, and that describes an attempt to turn people away from the way of salvation, and so uh, Paul says, you're going to be blind for a time. And sure enough, he is made blind for a time. This is a judgment upon his sin, but it's also a mercy because according to Deuteronomy 18, what he actually deserved was death. But what he was given was temporary blindness, the same kind of temporary blindness that Saul himself had experienced and which the Lord used as a tool of mercy in Saul to lead him to the Lord. And we're, not, we're simply not given an understanding of what did or did not happen in this man's heart as a result of his, of his blindness. But how did... How did Paul's pronouncement become a reality? Well, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is God. He has the ability to give sight, and he has the ability to withhold it. So how did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? Well, the Holy Spirit overcame the adversary. I've been reading a book um, uh, called The Pastor of Kilsyth. It's just a story of a common parish pastor in Scotland who uh, ministered, I think he was ordained in 1799, and he continued to minister until 1859. Uh, a lot of the story has to do with a brief, maybe 12, 18-month revival that his church and his parish enjoyed uh, in 1839. Part of the book is, is directed toward justifying the revival. There were false revivals. There were things that were simply the product of human emotion. And as this pastor is explaining how he knew that this revival wasn't simply emotionalism, how he knew that it was real, how he knew that it was a work of the Holy Spirit, he said this, quote, 
we have seen evil, unquote. You see, where the Holy Spirit is most at work, there our adversary will be most fierce in his opposition. And so expect it. Are you praying for revival? I'm continuing to pray for revival. Pray for revival in your own heart. Pray for revival in the hearts of the leaders of the church. Pray for revival in everyone in the church. And then pray that it would spill outside of the church to the communities around us. Please continue to pray that the Holy Spirit blows afresh in this place. And that he rouses us. That he revives us. That he ignites us. Please continue to pray for yourself first. And then for your leaders. And then for everyone. And if revival comes, what you're going to find is there's opposition from without. There's opposition from adversaries like the bar Jesuses of the world. You can expect it. And there'll be opposition from within because some of the fiercest opposition to the revival at Kilsyth came from other pastors who said, ah, uh, that's just a bunch of emotionalism. It's not. That's not real. Pray because spiritual warfare requires spiritual weaponry. You know this is true because Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we are to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is made harder in some sense by the fact that we don't have direct revelation, but we do possess the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who promises to give us spiritual discernment, and we do possess the Word of God which helps us to identify and to overcome our adversaries. But I think we face a, a particular danger that is endemic to our generation. In some respects, I think that we confuse Christianity with being nice. We confuse Christianity with being polite, and we desire to be nice, and we desire to be polite, but being nice and being Christian are the same thing. When, when Saul bef stood before Bar-Jesus and said, you son of the devil, he wasn't being particularly polite. When he said that he was full of all unrighteousness, when he said that he was full of villainy, he wasn't being particularly nice. When Jesus sat down in the temple and systematically braided a whip that you would use to drive cattle and drove the money changers out of the temple, he wasn't being particularly nice. He was being righteous. He was being just. He was being good. He was being holy. But those things are not the same as being nice. There's a line in the line, the witch in the wardrobe that has captivated you and it's captivated me since the day that it was penned. When they confess of Aslan, who is the Christ figure, he is not a tame lion. And therefore be watchful in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to call and equip his missionaries. Ask him to overcome the adversary. Ask him. You see, we have an adversary. Therefore, therefore pray. Pray that we would be harmless as doves, yes, but wise as serpents. Pray that we would recognize the distinction between being holy and being nice, between being righteous and being polite. Pray that we would have the courage. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your elders. Pray for your missionary leaders. Pray that we would have courage not to confuse Christianity with politeness because the kingdom of God is a thing of power. The kingdom of God is a thing of power and it's also a, a thing of warfare. And the same power exists today to overcome the adversary that existed 2,000 years ago. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit as he works through people whom he has called and commissioned. He demonstrates the power. Are you calling upon him to empower me, to empower your Sunday school teachers, to empower ministry leaders? Are you calling upon him to take what amounts to weak ineffective human words, just words, blah, 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 words. We hear words all the time that possess nothing of truth, nothing of power, nothing of dignity, just words, babble. But the Holy Spirit can take words, just human words, and do supernatural and divine things with words. He can turn words into swords for spiritual battle. Are you praying to him? Are you asking him to do this? Because if we ask the question, how did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? Well, certainly the, 
the Holy Spirit called the messengers, the Holy Spirit overcame the adversary, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who produced the fruit. He produced the fruit. Do you see that in verse, in verse 12, that the Holy Spirit produced the fruit? Then the proconsul believed when he saw all that had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The proconsul believed, and we have every reason to believe that that was genuine saving faith. But why, Luke says, why does, why does he believe? Well, he was astonished, and he was astonished at two things. One, he was astonished when he saw the sign or the miracle. Okay? In other words, uh, Saul said, you're going to be blind, and then the guy was blind, and he was astonished, Right? Because there was power. He's not a stupid man. So he saw there is power at work here that I can't explain. He was astonished at that. But then he was also astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And this could mean the content of the gospel proclamation. So he was astonished at the teaching about Christ Jesus and what he had done and what he was supposed to do. Or it could mean he was astonished at the manner or the method in which Saul and Barnabas went about their teaching. And in all likelihood, it's the latter, that he was astonished in the way that Paul and Barnabas went about their teaching. So we've got to look at at what Paul says about that elsewhere. And in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now that's a way of saying that the teaching came with power, visible, undeniable power, not what Paul calls lofty speech, not with what he calls plausible words of wisdom, but instead what he says in 2 Corinthians 4.2, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And the Holy Spirit supplied the power through the open statement of the truth leading to the salvation of the proconsul. How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? The Holy Spirit produced the fruit. The Holy Spirit produced the fruit. I watched a YouTube video a couple years. You know how sometimes you get on YouTube and you're just clicking from one thing to another and then something comes up and you think, that's dumb, so I'll watch it. It was one of those. It was two guys who were arguing with each other. One was the owner of a Ford. One was the owner of a Chevy. And they were arguing about which truck had more power. And so this is like redneck video 101. So what they did is they backed up their trucks to each other and hooked a huge chain to each of the axles. And then at the drop of the hat, they both gunned their engines going opposite directions to see who could out pull each other. And of course, one truck won and it out pulled the other. It demonstrated its power. And that guy was, oh, you know, he was all filled with testosterone. The other guy was ashamed and humiliated because his truck couldn't back up his talk. Well, Paul preached about power. He preached about a power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He preached about a powerful Lord who had overcome death. He preached about a powerful one who would return to judge. He preached about one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth had been given. And then the Holy Spirit demonstrated the power. The Holy Spirit backed up the talk. How does the Holy Spirit back up the talk today? Because you don't possess the power to say, hey, you, go be blind for a few hours. I don't possess that power. You don't possess that power. How does the Holy Spirit back it up today? How does he demonstrate his power? Every sinner saved is a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. In Ezekiel 36, the the Lord says to his people, I will give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, salvation is a fruit that the Holy Spirit produces. Has this happened for you? How would you know? Well, here's some good diagnostics. If, if you have turned from sin and you no longer trust yourself for your salvation, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit in you. 
If you have turned specifically to Christ Jesus and what He has done for your salvation, that's a fruit of the Holy Spirit in you. If you are pursuing, engaging in this lifelong pursuit of obedience to the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit in you. If you have experienced a shift in your desire such that my desire is no longer to promote myself, serve myself, feed myself, glorify myself, but your desire has shifted and continues to shift to, I want all of my life to glorify the Lord. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit within you. If your motivations have changed from, I want to do this so that I will look good, to I want to do this to honor Him who first saved me, and I'm now motivated by grace, and I want to do those things because I've been loved. I want to love because I've first been loved. It's good evidence that the Holy Spirit is within you. And if your lifestyle has changed from, being reticent to be inconvenienced by anyone else such that you're oriented toward others and you're beginning to live self-sacrificially, that you value your brothers and sisters and their time even more than you value yourself and your own. It's good evidence that the Holy Spirit is within you because you're no, no longer calling down blindness on your adversaries, nor am I, but you have evidence in you that the power of the Holy Spirit is still at work. And if you are increasingly dissatisfied with the extent to which you love and serve Jesus, it's good evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work within you. Our outward lives are important. Because a changed life is the biggest demonstration of the Spirit's power today. It's the most visible fruit that He produces is changing you. What do people see in you? Do they see this fruit of change in you? I mean, you can't say be blind, but you can say Jesus changed me, and the power is that your life proves it. Uh, what is different about you from your neighbor because you're saved? It, do you use your time differently? What about your money? Do you use it differently? What about your priorities? What do you want for your children? Uh, what about your use of t your tongue and your social media? What about your treatment of the least among you? Do these things set you apart from those around you? What's different tomorrow? Not on Sunday, but tomorrow. When you wake up on Monday morning, it's just another work day. What sets you apart from the guy in the cubicle next to you? What what is it? How is Christ impacting and changing you such that they see the fruit in you? And, and I'm going to ask you to do something, and this may step on some toes, it may not, but, but there are all things that we know we probably ought to do. Well, we all know that we ought to, to be about the business of fulfilling the Great Commission, but really we don't, and here's why I don't. I, I don't want to. I mean, really you can boil it down to a lot of things, but what it boils down to is I just don't want to. I know I should probably get up and come to Sunday school because the Word of God is a means of grace and it's being faithfully taught. I just don't want to. I know I should probably come back tonight at 6 o'clock because nobody's doing anything at 6 o'clock on a Sunday night and encourage men who are training for ministry, but I, don't, I just don't want to. Now, you can't force yourself to want something that you don't want, but you can ask the Holy Spirit to change your heart such that you want what He wants for you. Are you doing that? Are you asking the Holy Spirit to change your heart so that you begin to desire the things He desires for you? It's also important to recognize that Jesus said something really valuable about the human heart. And He said, he said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He didn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be. He says what you purposely choose to treasure, eventually your heart will be right there in it. If you purposely choose to do the things that you don't actually want to do, but you know you should do, eventually it helps bring your heart to a place of desiring to do the things that you previously didn't desire to do. See, and as we pray that, and as we make the commitment to treasure the things we're called to treasure, it's evidence, it's powerful evidence in our lives because, because the greatest spiritually dark territory in the world, it's not the Middle East, it's not the dead secularism of Europe, the greatest spiritually dark territory in the world is in your heart and mine.
And the way that I live gives evidence to the power of the Holy Spirit that he can triumph over that territory. How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? The Holy Spirit called the messengers. The Holy Spirit overcame the adversary. The Holy Spirit produced the fruit. How did the gospel triumph in spiritually dark territory? The Holy Spirit did it all. And where Christ is not, spiritual darkness will reign. But Christ, who is the light of the world, by His Holy Spirit scatters the darkness. So, so continue to say stuff about Jesus to people on purpose, praying for and trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit, for by His divine power, the Holy Spirit is God. He causes the gospel of Jesus Christ to triumph in spiritually dark territory, even as you know that He has caused it to triumph in you. Please pray with me. Our gracious God and Father, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us even today. Convict us of our sin, rouse us from our slumber, call us to service. Help us to know that call and then equip us for it so that by your power, Lord Spirit, by your power, a demonstration of it, the world will see that Christ reigns. The world will see that he changes men and women. The world will see the demonstration of his power in our lives. Holy Spirit, you overcome even the darkest of spiritual territory. So help us to have great confidence in you to speak and act and live as people who believe that you indeed triumph over spiritual darkness. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.